to the CHGO White Sox post-game show. Coming to you live from Studio A of our CHGO offices here in the West Loop of Chicago. I'm your host, Sean Anderson. Alongside me, the full CHGO White Sox crew. That's our CHGO White Sox beat writer, Vinny Duber. You can follow him at Vinny Duber. The man in the middle is Herb Lawrence. Hello. There you go. A little bit uh, more uh, kick in your step there. A little bit more uh, game. Hey, man. How can you not with that Michael Kopech performance? Follow him at Extra Wall 23. is our CHGO White Sox community leader. You can follow me at Sean underscore W underscore Anderson. Follow the show at CHGO underscore White Sox. We're being produced today by Lawrence Benedetto. Hey! hey Dominic that, Fletcher you know, with the game-winning yeah, RBI. Look Fletcher's at that. Fletcher's not ending it at all. But, you know, you get me on the show. Seven runs. Hey! You're the, you're the king. You're the reason me. why they scored it's as me. much I'll as they did. I'll be here all night every night from now on we're excited for you uh hit that thumbs up button hit that subscribe button very excited that you're joining us after this white Sox winner they win seven to five in cleveland it was one hell of a game there's a lot to talk about from today outside of the game and then the game itself was fairly interesting which is surprising for a white Sox game they win seven to five they got out to an early lead let's talk about that first before we get into the bad times because at first this top of the first inning herb where was this team this is electric boogie woogie woogie <laughs> maybe they need a lefty go against them i know they faced one lefty this year but uh they looked really good like you get the gro the gross from walk and then like four straight hits which is blowing my mind. They don't sometimes don't get four hits in a game, and they got four consecutive hits right there on that first inning. And scoring five runs and having everybody bat in that inning is amazing. But I knew there was another you know shooter drop. But for them and the offense to actually get started, have a game plan. It looked like they had a game plan versus Logan Allen to go the opposite way versus him because his. Balls were mostly going on the outside corners, uh, change up in his fastball. We're going that way. And so the White Sox and whatever the hitting coach was doing, Marcus Timms was doing, they were like, okay, let's attack the scouting report of what he's doing and hit the ball where he's throwing it. And so that is a godsend because you've been watching this White Sox offense all year long where they're hitting under 200 for the year. And then they execute versus a pitcher that has actually been doing well this year. Fast forcing fastball has been actually one of the best pitches so far in Major League Baseball, but today they attacked Logan Allen and made him pay. I mean, the offense had been nowhere to speak of through 10 games. Uh, the only game in which they uh, scored over three runs prior to tonight was the six runs in the game they lost, of course, and, the, and four of those runs came off thunderous Luis Robert Jr. home runs. They had not strung together anything prior to tonight. For them to do that in the first inning was a uh, sign that at least it's possible, uh, uh, you know, Connor bring or not Connor captivation brings up the fact there that uh, <laughs> I saw the C and, and looked away brings up that they were five they actually had five hits with runners in scoring position how about that Amazing. yeah I mean real quick I mean five for 13 with runners in scoring position it's better but still needs improved from captivation dance I will take a 384 batting average from this well, team especially with, with what they've position. been doing but I mean that's the thing is like every night we were we've been been sitting here and the game has ended and we've been talking about oh you know they didn't didn't really show up with the hits they missed an opportunity we're pointing at like opportunities to get one run oh they couldn't get you know the guy in who had a, a one-out double they couldn't bring him home and that was the game kind of thing that is how dry the offense had been what you saw in the first inning tonight is how a baseball offense is supposed to work even if there aren't many more runs to come over the course of a game you need that one inning where you string things together put a little bit of pressure on the other team and put up that crooked number heck they did that so that's what you that's all you can ask for from any offense is a first inning like the one you saw tonight from the White Sox yeah the fifth started off with a Robbie Grossman walk then Moncada hit a single the other way then Lenin Sosa your three hitter today hit an RBI 
double to make it one nothing. Then Vaughn with an opposite field RBI single. Corey Lee with an uh, opposite field uh, RBI single. Those two made it three nothing. And then Kevin Pillar pulled an RBI double down the line and made it five nothing. Somehow the Bulls are what, what, no. Our, are Bulls, our, Bulls team, our Bulls team just heard that the White Sox won. They're excited oh. about those runs in the <laughs> yeah. first inning. Yeah, hey, they're excited for that Kevin Pillar double. Uh, and then in the eighth inning, we saw a, a, a good job from Corey Lee, Andrew Benatendi getting on against Scott Barlow, and then Dominic Fletcher coming up, who we gave crap yesterday. Uh, you know, coming hey. through big with a sacrifice bunt to move the runner that didn't score, and then a, a, a gap double, which hey was huge for the Sox to give them that seven five lead for Michael Kopech to protect. Yeah. Um I'll we'll get to the bad part about the Dom Fletcher thing, and it's not his fault. But he came through. Scott Barlow threw a high um, slider, and he crushed it to the to the gap. Now I don't know if he's got a piano on his back and he's playing it, but like he got thrown out at third pretty damn easily. It was like, what are we doing out there? But I thought he had some speed. But hey, you come through right there, you could do whatever you want, and that's a second out at third, so it's not sacrilege. No, uh, and then too, uh, Lawrence, you flashed that graphic if you want to go to it. Uh, yeah, why not? Uh, the Logan Allen. Uh, uh, stack graphic. These are the White Sox balls in play against Logan Allen in the first inning, and you mentioned Marcus Timms and the game plan against Logan Allen, them attacking stuff on the outside, but you see a lot of those pitches. Middle. Every single one except you know the one that's actually inside, and I think that wasn't out, uh, or maybe it was the one that Lenin ended up pulling, uh, but all of them are middle of the zone and one thing that was surprising this was from go cubs 49 uh steven on twitter uh he put together team difference in in zone and out of zone swing swing rate i've talked a lot about uh i don't know if i've talked enough about it but there's this stat from uh robert Orr of baseball perspectives called seager i thought and, he was gonna say robert ory no, well it's <laughs> at, at not the bobby Orr. Robert Orr. Uh, but uh, <laughs> uh it's I love the it, Seager stat. Yeah, it's basically yeah. how much do, does a guy it's not swing at balls and only swing at strikes against the wind? Uh, huh? Yes, nice. Are like you that. not? What are you? Naming? You said the Seager stats. Uh, yeah. He hits it against the wind. Not Bob. Yeah. Corey. Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. Not Kyle. Corey. Uh, <laughs> anyways, <laughs> the team difference. It, it only tracks numbers that are made after dark because they're working on their night moves. Obviously, yeah. oh, there I it love is. It. God, I love it even more. Now. <laughs> Do you old men have any more Bob Seger references? We could do the whole show. Go, just yeah, Bob Seger just references. I don't, I don't even, I don't even Hollywood talk. Nights, anyone? Yeah. Yeah, That's well, just I, a good I mean, song. Yeah. yeah, The Cubs are kind of having some Hollywood Nights. Not really. They're or San, Diego. San Diego. Yeah. Anyways, what I'm trying to say, <laughs> Sox have the fourth best Seager rate in baseball. So they're not swinging at balls, and they are swinging at pitches in the zone. They haven't done damage on those pitches, but we saw a little bit of that today. Maybe that, uh, that you know, lack of offense starts to come around a little bit because they are at least swinging at the pitches that they should. From a statistical standpoint, mm -hmm. I know that you have some beef with Andrew Vaughn and him taking some pitches. He had a nice game today. Oh, hey, it, I, I heard James Fegan over the weekend talking about Andrew Vaughn's leg kick and needing timing. Seems like his timing was better today. And at least for the Seager stat itself at not swinging at balls and swinging at strikes, Vaughn is you know up there with Aaron Judge and Jordan Alvarez and Juan Soto so far. Like He's been pretty good at you know swinging at strikes only. My whole point is maybe if they can continue this discipline – Maybe there is some more runs in this offense that has been so inept. 16 runs in 10 games uh, or the, in the 10 games prior. Maybe there is a little bit of edge uh, or a little bit of life in this offense that we haven't seen in the first 10 games and saw tonight. I would love to believe in that, Sean. I, those stats are enlightening. But the White Sox have lost their three best offensive forces. So I don't think the offense will progress after this I think they will still go back to being themselves uh tomorrow and I think Andrew Vaughn specifically was just good versus Logan Allen and while he struggled last year versus lefties in his career he's had a really good time versus lefties and he saw Logan Allen perfectly this year so maybe this unlocks um Andrew Vaughn hopefully because he is the best offensive force the White Sox have well actually that's how maybe maybe it's Corey Lee because that's some bitch to this year. What the hell's got into him? Maybe it's Robbie Grossman. Robbie Grossman with two hits too and, uh, and a walk and a walk. Uh, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, if you did miss the game after the first run, uh, first inning where the Sox were able to get five uh, uh, runs, they batted around. Robbie Grossman uh, then stepped to the plate. I think he got out, and then Moncada comes up. He hits a slow roller to third base. Ramirez charges it. It seems like it could possibly be a bang bang play but Moncada doesn't even get the chance to make it a bang-bang play. He makes it 
89 feet pretty much, 88 feet if we want to be super specific, and crumbles. Doesn't even get to even lie on the bag. He's lying down right before the first base bag. Uh, White Sox number one enemy, Josh Naylor, was very nice and even helped up Moncada, so uh, points to uh, Josh Naylor there. But in 11 games, the White Sox have lost Aloy Jimenez to an adductor strain, Luis Robert Jr. to a hip flexor strain, and now Yohan Moncada seemingly gets the worst of it, not confirmed. The White Sox said a left adductor strain, and he will be further evaluated tomorrow. But just by the look of the way that he hit the ground, reminiscent of Aloy in 2022 in Minnesota, where you know he hits that first base bag and then crumbles and his face down. Moncada, very similarly, was taken directly into the clubhouse, and we didn't see him again for that night. Is it all, you know, I mean, how bad is this? I mean, does it get worse than this? Well, I mean, I, 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 didn't, didn't we ask the exact same question after oh. Robert got hurt? Yeah, there are other people that can get hurt. <laughs> so, yeah, it sucks that these three guys get hurt, but this is every year. This is what happens, except for Luis had a full, almost fully healthy year last year. But it sucks that these three specific guys got hurt, and they're the three guys on offense that the White Sox are mostly counting on to produce some runs. And so... And Moncada was having a decent start to his year again. Mm -hmm. And then another injury derails his early good season, which sucks because this is probably more than likely his last year as a White Sox with uh, $24 million on an option for next year. And I think the White Sox will definitely turn that down. Now, I would turn it down, and I'm a huge Yohan Moncada fan. But, yeah, um, I feel sorry for him. I feel sorry for Aloy. I feel sorry for Luis Robert because I know they're not trying to get hurt. But something's happening with these guys where they're not um, – they're getting this, all these soft tissue injuries that it sucks for them, but it's also like what's going on with the training staff? What's going on with your diet? What's going on with anything that's around you? What Like why are not anybody else getting hurt? Like Andrew Benintendi is the healthiest motherfucker ever. But well, except all well, of last year when he had but a he, hand, but a hand, but he can't like he like he can run the first his, himself all the time. Yeah, but also and never does anything with the bat. Ben and and Vaughn are just not athletic. I mean, part of this I think is just the athletic difference. I mean, these are the three most athletic people on the team getting injured. I think the reason why Andrew Ben and Andrew Vaughn don't get injured is because they're not doing things outside of what their body can physically handle they're not pushing their body to the limits where I don't know if Aloy technically is and maybe that's more of a, a stretching or diet question but Robert just played 150 games yep. like I'm he made it through running to first 150 times plus uh, last year and didn't have these injuries like it's shocking that all of these happen within an 11 game span yeah I mean that's the thing that sticks out for me is that like because I think what both of you guys said is true right like this is simultaneously here we go again and you can't believe this is happening because of the concentration of this in 11 games. I mean, this is, you know, I look back to 2021 when you've got the preseason injury to Aloy, you've got the uh, uh, late spring, early summer uh, uh, injuries to Robert and Nick Madrigal, right? And it's like, Oh my God! The you know the the sky is falling on the White Sox, and that was over the course of three four months. This is eleven days in which your numbers two, three, and four hitters have been just pulled out of your lineup. Pedro Grafal has now has to make a lineup every day without the three best hitters in it, yep. and uh, and it's not that it got to that point by season's end. It basically he has I mean he does he has a hundred and forty something games to now manage. Uh, we don't know how long any of these guys are going to be out. We don't know what the uh, situation is with Yohan Moncada. You're right, Sean. It looked like he was in a tremendous amount of pain. You don't usually uh, expect to the news to be good at all following a, a an image like that. But, I mean, listen, you want to know why Rick Hahn's rebuilding project didn't work? It was these three guys got hurt all the time and and more obviously Tim Anderson Yasmani Grandal the guy we're going to talk about Michael Kopech but now here we are at the start of a new rebuilding project and the same three guys cannot shake that I, I don't even want to say tendency or ability because that that kind of puts blame oh, yeah. on them which that shouldn't be but the just matter of factness that this keeps happening happening to these same three players um the Think, think back to 2017 or 2016 and all the expectations that were on these three guys. And here we are in 2024, and the story has never changed from 
man, if only they could stay healthy, man, if only they could stay healthy. And you're right, Herb, you, you, you feel for these guys. You, you heard what Aloy had to say. You, you saw Yoan down in pain uh, on the field today. Those are things you never want to see or hear. Uh, but Robert this, apparently couldn't sleep after his injury because he was so worried about it. And, and that sucks for those guys. And, 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 you know, your feelings go out to them. But the, at the end of the day, we're talking about we, – we talk about a baseball team and what's happening with it. Here we are again, another year in which – you know, the expectations weren't high, but inside that clubhouse, they were hoping to do some things. They were hoping to prove some people wrong. And you're going to, and, and if you would have told them that, hey, less than two weeks into the season, you're going to have a hand tied behind your back in the, in the uh, sense that you're not going to have your three best hitters, whoo, that's just really, really hard to get over. We are going to take a break. Um, and I think my biggest issue with it is just the lack of depth. And it's always been the lack of depth. And when R Robert goes down, you know, Right field's been such an issue. You're moving your right fielder or supposedly right fielder for 2024 over to center. And there's not really an actual right field plan. You're signing Robbie Grossman a week before the year. Moncada, there's still no backup plan for him. I mean, if they're going to call anybody up, it's either Lenin Sosa who moved over from second to third today, Danny Mendick, Colson Montgomery, Zach Remillard, if you're calling up an yeah. infielder, or Colos to play you know, some right field. Listen, you're not wrong. Obviously, depth has been a problem for this team, for, for, for this organization for several years now. But, I mean, I'll push back on the fact that, oh, boy, how do, how are they not prepared to weather the storm of their three best hitters being out? You know what I mean? Like, that, well, not many teams have a plug-and-play guy that can just step into the lineup for Luis Robert Jr., you know what I mean? Or, yes. or, the, or the player that they expect Aloy Jimenez or, or Yohan Moncada to be. And I know the Braves are full of riches, and we'll take a break. Herb's going to let you know about game time. Vinny's going to let you know about lining in a second. But you see the Braves, Spencer Strider goes down, and they have Bryce Elder, who was a pitcher for them last year. You see A.J. Smith Schauer, I think is his name. Uh, he's got the hyphenated name. Uh, he was pitching for the Braves last year. Like, they have guys with true experience and could be, you know, and they're still like 24, 25. You know, you're calling up Danny Mendick and Zach Remillard, who are, you know, in their 30s. I mean, maybe Sosa gets more run after the double, but we'll see. Let's take a break. We'll let you know about our friends over at Game Time and Line and Kugel, and then we'll talk a little bit about what Pedro Grafal had to say pregame about Moncada and if there's any, you know, worries about what happened with Moncada today and the pregame comments. Real but quick, her, isn't, isn't this show two? Am I wrong? This is, is this not show two? Um, no, this is show three. So we do a show on Sunday, Monday, and then Tuesday. So if I'm off, then maybe maybe I, I, you know, we have to discuss this with sales. Sure, we'll do this off air. Yeah, we're gonna do this Game right. time. You ready? Game time is now an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets even faster and easier. Prices on Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets to the first pitch. With killer last-minute deals, all-in prices, views from your seat, and their lowest price guarantee, Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying MLB tickets. Went to Atlanta a couple years ago, bought some tickets on game time, checked some of the secondary markets. Only one of them had a lower price in the section and row that I was in. Sent this information to game time, and within 12 minutes, I got 110% of the difference into my game time, game time account. You can save up to 60% off of buying last-minute tickets for sports, concerts, comedy, theater, etc. And save even more with exclusive in-app deals with select seats ahead of the game or event. And with zone deals, save even more when you choose a section and let game time choose the seats like I did for a Milwaukee game that I'm going to be watching on the 26th versus the Yankees. I think the tickets are usually $120. I got them for $88 by just choosing the zone deals. Get a panoramic view of your seat in the app before you buy. If you've ever been to a place with obstructing views, you know this comes in clutch every time. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. And for a limited time, and get $20 off any MLB purchase of $150 or more in the Game Time app with the code FIRST PITCH. Terms apply. That's F I R S T P I T C H for $20 off from March 25th to April 14th only. Download the Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed. Guys. Hello. Vinny. I was out of state yesterday. You were. I was not. I was unfortunately, though, not in the state where you want to be because if you notice outside, it's 60-some, 70, almost 70 degrees. It is. And that means it's shanty season. Mm. That means it's canoe season. It means you can jump in a canoe with your summer shanty and paddle all around the world. <laughs> it won't be summer. It won't be summer all around the world, just a fair warning. But 
Guys, Line and Kugels makes a delicious roster of beers, and of course our favorite is Summer Shandy because that means it's summertime, and uh, whether you want to go down by the lake and have a nice picnic, you're going to need a case of Summer Shandy. If you're going down to the rate for a tailgate, you're going to need a case of Summer Shandy. If you're going up to, ooh, Wisconsin, just canoeing around, throw, I, throw a case of Summer Shandy in that canoe. Guys, I heard a Wisconsin innovation is they have cooler the canoes uh coolers built into the canoes oh yeah when you rent a canoe in wisconsin there's a built-in canoe exactly. sometimes it's full of summer shandy naturally occurring <laughs> <laughs> but yes if you if you if you for some reason have exhausted your supply of summer shandy do not fret because there's berry vice there's honey vice which is made with real wisconsin honey there's the lakeside uh, cherry there's the the sunset wheat yep you can go up to wisconsin and get yourself a line he's original how about that Flavor Life Simple Moments with Line and Kugels, the official craft beer of the Chicago White Sox. Go to liney.com slash chgo to find delivery options near you. That's L-E-I-N-I-E dot com slash chgo. Or pick up Line and Kugels pretty much anywhere they sell beer. Line and Kugels, flavor the moment. Celebrate responsibly the Jacob Line and Kugel Brewing Company, Chippewa Falls. Yes. yes. All right. So from Daryl Van Scowen today... Pedro Grafal said, your favorite person, uh, Yohan Makata has dealt with minor soreness in hip slash groin area over the last few days, something he's playing through. Uh, and then Daryl noted that he stole second base yesterday, even through this pain. When we see what happens in the second inning, is it malpractice of the White Sox to play Yohan Makata? I mean, I do not have the requisite knowledge of human anatomy to know uh, how that uh, how that. Uh, Connect, which bone connects to which bone, to use the old, to reference the old song? Well, the foot bone connects to the ankle bone. Something and, uh, like that. But, uh, and but the yeah, knee bone I, connects to the adductor muscle. I think, every, I, think, <laughs> I think everybody, because of the amount of injuries the White Sox have dealt with over the last few years, I think everybody is quick. And I, when I say everybody, I mean a certain segment of the fan base uh, is quick to assume that something wrong is happening. Um, I don't think... That Pedro Grafol is saying, or 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 Chris Getz or anybody is saying, too bad, Yoan Moncada, you have to go out there and play. It is very much what what Pedro explained, which was going on with Aloy last week, which was, hey, there's a training staff here, there's a there's a strength and conditioning staff here, there's a medical staff here, plus the player is telling us what they're comfortable doing. They take all of that in effect to make sure these guys are capable of playing or not. You saw when Aloy Jimenez was dealing with something, they didn't play him for several days. You, 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 can't, you can't be mad on one hand that they're listening to the doctors and, and not playing a guy, and that on the other hand that they're listening to the doctors and allowing a guy to play. We will, of course, have to wait and see when we hear from, whether it be Pedro or Chris or whoever, about what this injury actually is and how long you know we're expecting uh, to, to, to watch this team without Moncada to see if that stemmed from that. But right now, he injured himself running to first base. I don't think you can say just because there was something that was bugging him, which really happens to every baseball player over the course of the season, that, up oh, they screwed it up and they were the ones that caused him to get hurt. You cannot connect those two dots yet. And also, didn't he run in the first inning when he got the single and he scored the run? So he was healthy enough to do that. He was the, running and hustling to first when go, he got injured. Yeah. And so, I mean, I don't think you can correlate the two. Maybe it is, as Vinny says. I do play a doctor sometimes on this set, but not today because I don't know the correlation between a hip being uh, sore and the adductor probably uh, being torn or whatever it was, sprained. So... I would say it's probably close, but I wouldn't blame any of the people. If Yohan said he can play and the trainers and the doctors said he can play, I think this is just a, not a fluke, but things happen. He was hustling, probably doing like like I did out there in that uh, concrete, doing too much for your body. How was your adductor after that? Oh, my God. It hurt the whole damn day. Well, can I ask you as a doctor, Dr. Herb Medicine Man, Yes, is... It the adductor magnus, the adductor longus, or the adductor brevis that you think is injured? Uh, I think it's the abductor asses. I'm sorry, pardon? Asses. Asses? Yes. Okay, all right. I don't, I don't know if that's a, a spot. I don't you know. Sure? We got we to gotta check your certificate. Uh, let's go to a... I went to, what is it? Uh, what is a Dr. Nick's one? Uh, Hollywood Upstairs Medical College. Yes. <laughs> uh, beef love with the super chat. Uh, how much did my good buddy Herb Lawrence lose on the Gar Guardians live money line? $25. Oh, look at you. I almost made like 60 
So hey, you it know, was worth it. It. it was they. The, hey, you took it when it was five nothing. I get the hedge. I get the hedge. My heart and the money. Like if I would have lost, I'd be like, baby, at least I got sixty dollars. Now I got a White Sox second victory of the year. Let's go. I'll take that twenty five dollars and donate anytime. Also, too, if you see Herb tweeting about the Cubs game tonight, it's not because he's a White Sox fan. It's because he's a half Padre fan as well. Yeah, I, I love the people reacting. You know, I couldn't our, believe your your mentions. Even it's our ridiculous. guy Jack Silverstein, he's like, yeah. oh, look at what the the White Sox are doing to uh, longtime White Sox fans. It's just like, no, Herb's just watching his other damn and team. And also, the yeah, I am a White Sox <laughs> fan, but how can anybody? Watch that game last night and get not get hyped up except for Cub fans. Then we came back from eight nothing and Tatis hit a home run to win it pretty much. So I, yeah, I almost wore my Fernando Tatis is oh, good at baseball shirt. So beautiful, I totally game. forgot. Really glad you didn't. I'm really glad I, you I forgot. I hope they lose again. Um, I hope the Cubs lose again to the Padres exactly, and, and then lose again tomorrow because Dylan Cease is on the bump. And when they stop playing the Padres, you won't care what the Cubs do. Except when they beat the White Sox for those games that we're going to be at the uh, at the cell. And you come see fireworks with and the ECH Joe takeover. Thankfully, Barb's in timeout, and she can't yell at Herb in the chat. Yeah, uh, when is the Cubs chat? Do we know? Yeah, it's, oh, okay. it's after so the game, Barb. Yeah, after the be game, here. and I don't think the game has started. Um, one quote I wanted to go to, this was from preseason, and Vinny, you were down in spring when Alois said this. He said, the goal is to play 150 games this season alongside Moncada and Robert Jr. And I don't understand... People are allowed to fan however you want to fan. And I think it was the bear show or the bull show that said, you know, the biggest part about fan is connecting with players and experiencing the highs with them, right? Yep. Like me seeing Michael Kopech go out and throw 104.5 miles per hour with his fastball and going through two innings, dominating the Cleveland Guardians, has me hyped up because I'm a Michael Kopech supporter and I want to see him support, uh, you know, thrive. I don't get where people are like, oh, look at Aloy being stupid saying he wants to play 150 plus games with Mankata and Robert. What the hell is he supposed to say? I want to go out and in the first 11 games hurt my adductor muscle. And I want Yohan Mankata to tear his off the bone. And on top of that, I think it'd be great if Luis Robert Jr., after hitting a double, hits the first base bag and his hip flexor pops. Like, of course he wants to play 150 games. And him getting injured is not a sign that he didn't want to play 150 games. Like, what are you guys on? What are you talking about? It's nonsense. Aloy, Mancata, and Robert aren't trying to get hurt. And I'm not trying to blame the White Sox trainers or doctors, but we saw this with Tim Anderson. They're not the only people with groin or hip injuries on the White Sox since the pandemic. This has been a White Sox issue, and maybe it is the players. But also, I'd have to think, if it's the players, it also might be the training staff. Like, I don't think you can actually pinpoint this White Sox issue to, this is Moncada's fault. This is the training staff fault. This is them not stretching or them working out too much and not doing enough baseball activities, like Ozzy said. I don't think you can pinpoint it. Injuries are freak, and it's just unfortunate that the ride has really culminated every single injury into an 11 game span like if this was happening and Mankata gets hurt in August Robert gets hurt in June Aloy gets hurt in April I don't think we're seeing this big commotion about you know all of these injuries happening like it's baseball the human body's weird I don't think you can really truly protect this stuff from happening I mean if we're talking about injuries and people who are injury prone look no further than the twins like, Byron Bucks has played a good majority of these games, but we know he's always injured. And, what, the first or second game, Royce Lewis got hurt. People are injury-prone sometimes. People get hurt who every year, and it's not anybody's fault. They're not trying to get hurt. And, yeah, like you said, I, I know that White Sox fans are frustrated with the team, the organization in particular, but to be frustrated at those players who get hurt with these injuries – it seems, like, very, very weird. Like, you get mad at Aloy when he did the, the, the Vince Carter thing and he injures himself there. But when he's just trying to run the bases and he gets hurt, like, what's your, what's your gripe? What's your beef? Hey. Hey, what's your beef? That was for somebody else. Uh, <laughs> but it's just weird, guys. Like, it's weird energy. And I know that you want to turn the page on Aloy and turn the page on Yoan Moncada. They would prefer to play 160 games healthy. They would love for you to be cheering in the stands for their success. They don't want to be on the sidelines, rehab it again, and looking at a badass team. So how about we do something like the Phillies do when 
Trey Turner was going through a bad time when he had his first year with the Phillies. Phillies fans, notorious bad fans, and boo everybody. How about we go and we give them some encouragement and say, hey, Yohan, man, we know you're out for a certain amount of time. We're going to wait until you come back. And when you do come back, we're going to give you encouragement. Same thing for Louis. Same thing for Aloy. Instead of just saying, yeah, those guys are trash. They always get hurt, and they're getting hurt, and then lumping them all together. Oh, the Cuban players suck. And Aloy's not Cuban, by the way. But I just don't like it. I don't like the tenor of these, uh, these conversations, and I don't like you blaming the player for the injury that he sustained. Yeah, I, yeah, of course, yeah. I think you're, uh, that, is, that is absolutely correct. Um, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, you've got to look at it through the White Sox, and I think I, I understand where the frustration is coming from because, as we mentioned, this is happening every year, and, and it's happening in big chunks, right? I mean, like, we, we've, got, we've got a report saying that the team might, expect, uh, might believe that Robert might miss several months, right? I mean, how many times have we seen Aloy miss several months? Yoan Moncada is kind of the exception there because he plays through all this stuff all the time. Back problem uh, year, you yeah. know, certainly last year he had an injury that lasted several months, but he played through it. The years prior to that, he's playing through all the, kind of the regular bumps and bruises of a baseball season, and that's why I think when I heard Pedro or when I read that Pedro said that earlier today about you know the hip groin kind of stuff, I'm like, well, yeah, I mean. It's not surprising that Moncada's playing. Moncada plays through this stuff all the time. This is what has kind of defined the last several years of his career. I mean, going all the way back to 2020 when he played through the after effects of the COVID infection. So, um, you know, obviously this looks like it could end up being a bigger deal just based on the level of pain that he appeared to be in on the field. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the, 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 the frustration is understandable. I'm sure the organization feels the same way. The, oh man, here we go again, this stinks. But at the same time, definitely don't attack these guys and don't attack them for setting a goal that you want to see them reach, right? right? You'd love to see Aloy Jimenez play 150 games, I'm sure. So more power to him to want to do that at the end of the day. That doesn't end up being the case, not because it wasn't realistic, maybe, but because it just didn't end up coming true. Yeah, and I'm glad Herb said that in the chat to Andy. Uh, do you really think that these guys aren't stretching? I, I, I don't know if they're not stretching, but also it's just not that simple. I think if the White Sox have all of these injuries, it's just not going to be like, oh, you know what? None of our guys are stretched yeah, in right. three years. <laughs> I can't believe no one's thought of that No one's yet. thought about that. Uh, <laughs> we're going to hit a break in just a second. Uh, Trevor Story got injured for the Red Sox today, and he was crying apparently to Chris Cotillo of uh, Boston Mass or just Mass Live, and he said, it's something I hung my hat on in my career, being able to play and post. That hasn't been the case the last couple of years. I just love this game, man. I put my heart and soul into it, and I, I feel like that's no different for Moncada, Aloy, and Robert. I mean, even Aloy saying, it's so frustrating, I want to go home. Like, I, I, I don't know. It's... It's not their fault, and it's just frustrating for, I think, everyone involved. Um, and I think mostly it's on the team trainers and doctors to put them in better positions because I think Moncada, Jimenez, and Robert, and I don't think there's anything truly wrong with Jimenez and Robert's injury because, I mean, they were fresh and, you know, just started the season. Um, I, I don't think it's them putting in – their players in the best uh, situation. Anyways. Let's take a break. Want to let you know about our friends over at Circa Sportsbook. The world's largest sportsbook is in Illinois, and you are doing yourself a disservice if you do not download it. Download the Circa Sports Illinois app at circasports.com slash Illinois dash app. at circasports.com slash Illinois dash app to sign up today. We're going to be throwing a great Circa watch party and event with them on April 25th and 26th for the Bears draft party. The show on the 26th is sold out, but you can still get tickets for the 26th for the second and third round for the Bears show. Our friends over at Circa are throwing that party, uh, and they encourage you to download and explore all sports betting apps available, compare the lines from each sports book, and most of, if not every time, you will see that Circa has the best lines for you to take. Um, they don't limit their players based on winnings as well. So if you keep betting uh, the White Sox opponent when they're down and you start just racking up wins, Circa's not limiting you. Uh, Thank every, you Circa. every player has the same limits, unlike other books who do limit winning players, and games will strive to be a minus 110 split on the Circa Sports menu, unlike other sports books, which may use a minus 115 or minus 120 split. So you are getting the most for your bet. Download the Circa Sports Illinois app at circasports.com slash Illinois app today. Also be on the lookout, again, for the Circa events, watch parties, and tailgates we have coming up. If you or somebody you know may have a problem with gambling, call 100 Gambler, 1-800-426-2537. Text GMB to 833-234. Visit areyoureallywinning.com. 
What makes CD1 price cleaners unique? Their low prices. Customers save over 30% on their dry cleaning bill by switching to CD1 cleaners. Simple, transparent service. Other cleaners charge a different price for every garment type. Plus, they have upcharges. You may pay a different price for something that you do one time, and then the next time you visit, you're paying a different price. But at CD1 Cleaners, they charge one low price on any garment. Yep, even sports jerseys. The same one low price. CD1 Price Cleaners has your order ready the same day or the next day. Other cleaners take up to two to four days to have your clean garments ready. And CD1 Price Cleaners sends you a text when your order is ready for pickup. And they have a wide variety of services. Dry cleaning, wash and fold laundry, blankets and comforters, tailoring and alterations, leather cleaning, area rug cleaning, etc. What you need to do right now is go to chgo.cdone.com. The link is in the description. Once there, you can pick in from you can pick from one of the in-store coupons, online pickup or delivery options. Once again, chgo.cdone.com. The link is in the description. Thank you, Herb. And we have 142 people watching now and only 44 likes. As Sarah says, our, our typical producer, make it make sense. If there's 144 people and only 44 likes, that means 100 of you have not hit that like button. It's right under the video. If you'd be so kind, we'd love if you hit that like button like Ozzy's telling you. All right? Hit that thumbs up button. Let's go. Um, let's get a little bit more into the game, unless there's more on Moncada. It feels like we'll obviously see what... The announcement is tomorrow. I can't imagine Same that it times. will be good. Uh, Future Sox did say that in the first inning, uh, Oscar Colas was pulled in Charlotte. So maybe, just maybe, that is the corresponding move. Um, but I think it's also interesting that Patrick Nolan notes uh, in 2021, the Sox played without Aloy and Robert for almost three months. And in that time span, they were 44 and 28. Right? Like, I, if this team was in a better position, didn't cut – all the payroll of their 2023 team, maybe this team's able to weather it, but it just does seem like such a bleak spot where, you know, you're basically trying to be carried by Andrew Benatendi and Andrew Vaughn. But remember who carried, remember who carried that team back then too, right? Yep. I mean, that was the year in which your mean Mercedes got off to the hot start. Mm -hmm. That was the year in which Jake Lamb and Billy <laughs> Hamilton God, and Brian Jake Goodwin <laughs> were coming up with all those big hits. I mean, the that that was a case of the next man up stepping up, right? And obviously all these guys say that all the time, but it's a matter of doing it. And mm -hmm. I'm not sure that if that same collection of hitters would have been, you would have taken that into 2022 and then those guys get hurt and you replace them with that, that that would have happened again, right? Correct. It was probably a perfect storm of those guys just getting the job done in that moment. So is it possible that the White Sox could win some games with these guys all out at the same time? Of course it is. But you're going to have to get Lenin Sosa and maybe Oscar Colas and, you know, Corey Lee and all, the, all these guys who you didn't expect to do much of anything – to step up and 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 make these and make these plays. Robbie Grossman's the team's leadoff hitter right now. <laughs> a week before spring training started, no, or spring training ended, nobody he wasn't even on the team. Nope. So the idea is that these guys have to perform in a way that wins baseball games. Heck, they did it tonight, right? And they did it without those three guys, with the exception of Moncada's uh, contributions in the first inning. But they did it without those three guys tonight. The reason that worked in 2021 wasn't because, oh, they were finally free of Aloy and, uh, and, and Robert, or, oh, they were finally, uh, you know, they had so much depth. They were just the deepest organization in the world. It's just that the guys who happened to be in the lineup got the job done. That's what it, it's going to take this time, too. And just real quick, I hate when the chat puts me in a spot where I have to defend the White Sox, but Kevin's saying, yeah, but they had one of the best pitching staffs in the AL in the first half. That's also true. Right now, they got, what, the 15th best ERA in, in Major League Baseball? Yeah. And then at, yeah. with starting pitchers, it's the 12th best. Yeah. Uh, a three six six ERA from uh, the starting pitchers so far. We don't know what this rotation will look like how long crochet will be a starter until he needs some sort of break Soroka didn't look great today but you know so far so good at least on the starting pitching front it's just really been the runs and the run aspect so uh, we'll, we'll see what this team looks like tomorrow after a likely yawn Moncada move uh, again hit that thumbs up button if you haven't yet um, let's get into the Sox win uh, I think the biggest thing that we should probably jump 
into is the Michael Kopech outing. Yes. Uh, Jordan Leisure was pretty good for the Sox today. I don't know if it was as electric as Michael Kopech. No one uh, But at TJ Stats, uh, my guy on Twitter, uh, puts out great pitching summaries of Michael Kop- or of pitchers throughout the day of MLB pitchers. And earlier he had a thread of the best fastballs in Major League Baseball. Michael Kopech had a 117 TS or TJS, TJ Stats uh, stuff plus rating. His four-seamer today, 116, which is surprising because his average velocity was 100.4. He got a 37.5% chase rate and a 53.8% whiff rate on that pitch. He, on what I think it was uh, seven whiff, or seven and 14 swings, he had seven whiffs. Uh, so 50% of the time the Guardians were swinging at a Michael Kopech pitch, they were missing. He also had four called strikes, a called strike whiff rate of 46%. He was locating in the zone, and he threw his fastball 23 of 24 times. Uh, Really fantastic stuff, and you can see this popped up uh, on the screen now, but uh, just dominating stuff from Michael Kopech where he's throwing that fastball high in the zone and saying, hit it. And they didn't. And they didn't. He was untouchable. There was a couple that were in play, but they were all outs. I I mean... He he was untouchable. Yeah, it it was incredible. And I mean, the 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 first inning that he threw in the eighth inning blew it by him. I don't think they made. I I don't even remember them fouling off a pitch. And and the last pitch uh, that he throws that inning is strike three at 102 miles an hour. I mean, this is a completely (laughs) different Michael Kopech than we saw last year. Not that the fastball wasn't good last year, but what you just said. Somebody told him, "Hey, you got that fastball. Just throw it by them and see if they can hit it." And guess what? They couldn't. He looked so good tonight. A two-inning save was not unusual. If you were to see that from even someone as accomplished as Liam Hendricks in the last couple of years for the White Sox, you would have been like, wow, what a what a job by Liam Hendricks to go out there and get six outs. Michael Kopech, you're like, well, yeah, he was a starter last year. Of course he can if, of course he can throw uh, six outs, especially if he's only throwing 13 pitches in the, in the first inning that he throws there. So um, I don't know if six out saves and what he's already got uh, multiple appearances where he's thrown over 30 pitches. I don't know if this is going to be the norm for the way they use Michael Kopech, but man, what a weapon to have when that guy can come out of the bullpen and throw just absolute gas by these hitters. And I know the results probably dictate how he is and how he looks to me, but he just looked like, like you were saying, like he's 100. Confident. Enjoy. Yeah. Do what you can. You can't do anything with it. Here's a hundred. Here's a hundred. Here's a hundred. Now, like that should be Michael Kopech's mo. He should be like, y'all can't touch me. He should be in that mindset when he's on the mound because they can't. Like you saw Jose Ramirez, one of the best hitters in baseball. He kept on fouling those balls off. He was not getting close to him. He was tipping them off, and then he, fi- he finally threw him the only slider that he threw in that whole sequence of the two innings it was in. He got a piece of it, and then he threw a fastball right down the middle. He was like, hit it. Mm-hmm. And Jose Ramirez just was froze at the plate because Michael Kopech was just that dominant. He just looked jacked up and confident as hell that he knew that Cleveland couldn't even mess with him. And at, you know, old times, you'd be like, oh, man, Michael Kopech's coming in the game with only a two-run lead. Uh Uh-oh, here comes a bunch of walks, or here comes a walk-off home run by Jose Ramirez. Not today. Well, but how about the team giving him a reason to be confident, too? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, Don Fletcher steps in and gets that big hit, that big two-run double that breaks the tie. That's the top of the eighth inning. And then all of a sudden, it's like, oh, this is what we play for. This, you know, you, you, you're supposed to get a late clutch hit. It's about situational hitting and then shutting the other team down. I mean, there's a little bit of momentum that comes with Fletcher getting that hit, handing it off to Michael Kopech, and Michael Kopech saying, all right, I'm going to bring this home. Absolutely. And then, too, I just want to focus in on that Ramirez at bat. Uh, seven pitches were thrown. He's coming up with a homer earlier today. He's three for four. Uh, oh, he didn't get a homer. He homered was, yes, it, it yesterday, was, right? It was, um, it was Naylor. Naylor, yeah. But he hit a lot of balls hard today. Three, three for four. Yeah. Pretty good. Uh, it really does feel like it's a homer every time it gets the Sox. Uh, the first one was a ball that he missed high, and I immediately got a sick feeling. Uh, and then I'm like, well, why don't you walk him? But then, again, it's a 7-5 game, so if you're putting somebody on, then you're just putting the tying run, or the, you know, uh, you're, you're putting the tying run at the plate. Uh, the first one's a ball high. Then he gets a swinging strike on Ramirez, and the two that Ramirez hits the first two that he, he swings at he's swinging with one hand like mm-hmm. he is trying to put his full force into it and he is just hitting air and or barely following them off um and then the slider foul ball we noted it it's in the middle of the plate but it's under the zone down and he 
barely gets his bat on it. And I think, really, Ramirez is the only hitter in Major League Baseball that could even get a piece of it. And then another fastball up high that Ramirez somehow falls off. And I think Kopech is just thinking, with confidence at this point, he just swung at a slider low. So if I throw anything low, he probably thinks it'll be a breaking pitch that he'll, he'll probably lay off on. And if I throw a pitch high, he's probably looking for a fastball high because that's where I've been throwing the majority of my fastballs. Just ices him on a fastball, 101 at the knees. Like, I, I truly think that that is the best sign for Michael Kopech, especially after having a rough outing on Friday uh, against Kansas City where they end up lo- losing that game. He really does truly seem just so confident in that one pitch and that one pitch only. And when I saw that against the Braves, I made a comment, you can't live like a closer throwing one pitch 80% of the time. After seeing this, and he's throwing it 96% of the time, I feel like I need to take those words back. You said like only like two guys, like Zach Britton and like another pitcher, really have had success throwing 80 plus percent fastballs as their as their closing pitch you, as their pitch that they're throwing you listen well and I was just about to segue there you go Herb uh since the Statcast era uh only Zach Britton and Sean Doolittle have been successful closers throwing one pitch more than 80 percent of the time Britton had that sinker he threw 88.9 percent of the time Sean Doolittle had a fastball that he featured 86.2 percent of the time there's also Tony Singrani James Pazos Richard Rodriguez but uh Doolittle and Britain are kind of next level from those guys and Kopech's out here throwing it 90% of the time and he's averaging 101 and he's got that flat plane where it's really hard to square up a ball that's high in the zone so if he's throwing it 100 it seems like it's rising like it's been clear that the Royals really couldn't hit it the Guardians couldn't hit it the Braves couldn't hit it the Tigers really couldn't hit it it seems like he's himself in this role and that's really great to see just because we saw so many ups and downs for Michael Kopech and it always felt like the talent was there it finally feels like he's building upon this talent with true success we remember what we saw at the plate from Luis Robert Jr. in 2022 you know a guy's waving at that oh, yeah. at pitches outside the strike zone certainly once he had that wrist injury it was you know even more pronounced but and he looked like that guy at the beginning of last season too a little bit and Pedro Grifol made has made the comment ever since Luis has you know figured it out, saying if you stay in the strike zone, they can't they can't beat you. Nope. And Michael Kopech's pitcher, he's doing it from the other side of the of the ball, but it's the same thing, right? We watched him all last year, mm-hmm. missed the strike zone, missed the strike zone, and it was so easy for the other team to beat him. And here he is tonight. He didn't miss the strike zone, yeah. and when he doesn't miss the strike zone. They can't beat him. <laughs> well, and two, other Sean and Kevin are bringing up the slider. Uh, other Sean saying the slider will probably be mixed in when the weather warms up a little bit more. Kevin saying if he gets that slider working, he can throw it for strikes. Look out. I don't know. When you're facing six, seven, eight, nine of a lineup, especially Cleveland's lineup where they don't have these guys that can really create power, nope. I- I'm fine with him throwing 100% fastballs because that pitch is – one of, if not the best, singular pitch in Major League Baseball. He's throwing it five times or uh, five miles per hour faster than he was last year. He was sitting 95.2. He was sitting 100.4 today. And as Connor mentions, did Kopech hit 102? He maxed out at 102. That's the fastest Sox pitch since Bobby Jenks clocked at 102, August 27, 2005, at Safeco per baseball almanac. So he is just next level when he is able to just have all of that energy and devote it to six batters and even that slider I mean he's able to take that from 85 miles per hour to 90 miles per hour so just that velocity uptick we saw it be beneficial for right now the Lopez even Jimmy Lambert Michael Kopech I think it's taking him from like a a struggling starter who's trying to spot 95 to a dominant closer that can just blow 100 by you and it's great to see him be able to build confidence I don't think that the starter thing is going to be a so, true reality, even if he does continue to thrive in this role, because you found him, you found you found something successful for him. I, I don't. I this think, is him. Yeah, let let him eat. Yeah, this is him. This is what he should be. And I hear what you're saying. The seven, eight, nine hitters, they're not going to do any damage for issue, but he should have that mentality all the time. I mean, he kind of did. Ball. He threw, yeah. threw five straight fastballs to yeah. J Ram and said, yeah. "Hit it." He's like, "Here, hit it." If you if you beat me, I'll tip my cap. We got another guy, the next guy. I mm-hmm. guarantee I'm gonna strike Josh Naylor out. Type of that type of mentality he has to take into the next start. And forget about this one. Cool, good to get the Guardians out, but I'm gonna be called upon maybe with Cincinnati on Friday. Mm-hmm. 
All right, step in the box, uh, L.A. De La Cruz. See this, ni- see this 98 up top. <laughs> and, Maybe one on two. And, and listen, we'll Imagine see if, if he gets a hold of that one. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> we'll Maybe. see what becomes the consistent outing, right? Because as as good as Michael Kopech has looked in this reliever's role so far, and certainly as good as he looked tonight. He's had multiple appearances where he's walked multiple guys, right? I mean, we, he came in tonight. I think he'd thrown five in a third inning. He had walked five guys. Like, he he needs to make tonight more the norm, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, the, to me, the thing that is the most impressive about tonight is no walks, right? Because he puts a guy on base, and the outing looks a lot different, right? Maybe he doesn't – maybe he goes over 20 pitches in that eighth inning, you know, and all of a sudden, mm, maybe the ninth inning is not as realistic for him because he's exhausted himself a little bit. And you're facing one, two, three in the ninth, too. Right, or – Or, or in the eighth. Or what if he puts a guy on in front of Ramirez? Ugh. And now all of a sudden, you're throwing to Ramirez, who's the tying run at the plate – Things get a little bit dicier than I just blew everybody away with with strikeout, strikeout, strikeout. So if he can do this, to if he can do this kind of thing tonight, where even if it's not 102 and he's got six strikeouts on six batters, just don't walk anybody. That's going to help you out an awful lot. And I'm sure if he does walk somebody there, his confidence is a little hurt there, and so with that much confidence drop off so you're facing now Jose Ramirez without the confidence you had because you just got four guys out in a row uh, when you get Steven Kwan to gro- uh, ground out you're like okay this is not where I'm at I'm not the guy that I thought I was with the seven eight nine hitters I'm kind of weak now no nah, he's like fuck Jose Ramirez I don't care if you hit a home run do your thing and that's the attitude you have to have that's I mean I, I'm sure he took that from Liam Liam said that all the time Throw some pitches with confidence and some some conviction that they can't hit you. And Vin brought up, too, the Fletcher double gives you a cushion. Yes. Like, if this is a 5-5 game, maybe his confidence is a little bit more waned. Maybe he doesn't have that same FU attitude, and he doesn't have that same cushion where, you know, if Ramirez takes him out, he still has a one-run lead that he can protect, right? Yeah. Like, you I can't, mean, you can't, it's huge. You can't, you can't slam the door if it's open to the other side. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, absolutely. You Did you make that up? Yeah, I kind of did. I, I think you could ghost right for Bob Seger. Um, and just to, like, uh, Kevin brings up, uh, do you think he, I think he needs a second pitch like Liam. Uh, his Kopex fastball reminds me of Liam. Again, it's it's a unicorn pitch. He is throwing this 100.4 and sitting at 100.4. He's got crazy tail, more tail than Liam has, and he's got more backspin on it that makes the ball rise more. So he's got this crazy absurd fastball. He was sitting, again, 100.4. Liam, in his best years, was sitting 97.7 and 97.6 with his four-seam fastball, and that was with the Chicago White Sox. He would also scream at you when the ball was coming in, too, which which I'm sure uh, helped his efforts. (laughs) Put a couple more miles on it. If Kopech starts swearing, you might hit 105. Um, But yeah, yeah, it's I, I really don't think that he needs a secondary pitch because it's just faster and better. I really do think that this is a next level fastball. And when you see the percentages of fastball across Major League Baseball declining, I think it's huge for Michael Kopech to go the complete opposite way and say, no, I'm going to sit 101. You try to hit it. Well, and remember that this is the chess match, right? I mean, we're at the outset of this season. Mm-hmm. Cleveland hasn't faced him since la- since last year. Cleveland's going to face Michael Kopech again this season. They will. And now they've got this experience, right? I mean, heck, you saw even in this game tonight, he goes and he just destroys the 7-8-9 hitters. First pitch of the, of, the ninth, of the bottom of the ninth inning, Stephen Kwan is just like, I'm going to get out in front of this thing. And he almost rips an extra base hit if it wasn't right at Lenin Sosa. If it's a foot to either side mm-hmm. of Lenin Sosa, that's two bases for Stephen Kwan, mm-hmm. and that game changes immediately. Mm-hmm. So they're going to start knowing that this is the kind of thing that's coming from Michael Kopech. To have that starter's background where he has had those extra pitches could end up working in his favor because it's then the chess match, right? Okay, maybe the hitter thinks he's only going to throw fastballs, or maybe the hitter thinks that he thinks that he's only going to throw fastballs, so he thinks that he thinks that he's going to, you know, and it goes on and on and on like that. And if Michael Kopech can win that chess match, whether by just throwing a fastball every time or by mixing in other things, that makes him even harder to hit. Well, and two, if he actually gets that slider back foot to Ramirez, that's a whiff, and that's that's strike three. That's literally what I was thinking game about. Over. Yeah. It's just the fact that it's middle-middle, and he was able to get a little piece of wood on it. He would have corkscrewed himself into the core of the earth. <laughs> oh, my God. That would have been the best strike three. I mean, that oh would have been Chris Sale and Machado yeah. levels of, of a strike three game ender. Uh, and two, the balls that the... 
Guardians put in play uh, a ground out from Stephen Kwan, 78.5 miles per hour exit velocity, and then Jimenez, 86.9 uh, miles per hour fly out. So they really weren't even squaring it up, and they, they were a little bit late there. I, I, I'm, I'm all for him just letting his fastball eat because, A, it's fun. Uh, and B, uh, it's, it's like successful triple digits. so far. You gotta uh, like triple digits. And I think his body can handle it. When you're a 6'6 horse like Michael Kopech is, and you got, you know, 6'9 Garrett Crochet throwing uh, 100, like, that's a pretty good one-two punch. Well, when, when's, the last, when's the last time? What does this remind you of? This reminds you of Garrett Crochet when he came up as a rookie in 2020 and was throwing 101 every time, right? It's kind of, kind of, it's nothing more than funny, or you know that that's the guy that this yeah. reminds you of, and they've now flipped places. But that's that that's the last time that watching a, a White Sox reliever. No offense to Liam Hendricks, who was excellent every time out, but you expected that from him. That's the last time you saw somebody who really made you just go, your eyes pop and go, wow. And Blake name does bring up. I mean, we did see. Uh Groot throw uh, some pitches over 103. Uh, April 23rd, he set the franchise record with 103.1 mile per hour fastball. So Connor is finally wrong. We have seen someone prove Connor wrong. Well, so that's what that Connor, Connor gets for looking at baseball almanac instead yeah, of and not stat cast. Because <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> Santos had one at 103.1. Uh, uh, love that station. Also 102.3. Shout out. Uh, and then uh, Tygo Vera. Tiago. Tiago Vera. Yes. My bad. I don't know how to say that. Uh, Tiago Vera, uh, 102.2. So he, he also eclipsed uh, 102. So we're going to see who's the first one to hit oldies 104.3. <laughs> yeah. Jack great FM. Times, great oldies. Uh, <laughs> it's been a lot of things. Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> RIP. Uh, again, uh, thank you everyone for watching. We do appreciate it. We got a little bit more uh, to wrap up here. Uh, hit that thumbs up button. We're close to getting to Alloy Like. So we're at 73. So if you haven't hit that thumbs up button, we would appreciate it. How many viewers we got, uh, Law? 122? 122. So I don't know my, my math there, but about like 48 people haven't liked the video by that math. So make it make sense, folks. Uh, go hit that thumbs up button. We would appreciate it. Uh, so kind of footnotey. I think this is literally the definition of a footnote. Joe Colley published a piece today, the Sun-Times, at 1221 about Billy Donovan's link to Kentucky. And at the end... Joe Colley says, Donovan has two years left on his current deal. And even if the front office and Bulls ownership didn't value Donovan, Chairman Jerry Reinsdorf does not like paying dead money for fired coaches. A source recently said that Reinsdorf, who is also the chairman of the White Sox, knew that ma manager Pedro Grafol had put in a fireable season by midsummer of 2023, but he wanted to wait at least a year so the dead money wasn't a big hit. Bruce Silvine at 538 puts out a tweet saying, in response to a media story today, which just say Joe Colley's story, about manager Pedro Grafal, White Sox chairman Jerry Reinsdorf adamantly denied that the White Sox have ever considered firing Pedro Grafal. Reinsdorf told me that what's happening is clearly not Grafal's fault. What do we make of Colley's first report and then five hours later, Reinsdorf putting out uh, something to Bruce? I mean, we know that Pedro is now safe for probably the year because I'm sure that the last thing that Reinsdorf wants this year is to make Joe Colley right. So whatever, if he, I'm sure Joe Colley is well-sourced and all, and I'm sure that this story had some type of uh, truth to it. But um, I'm not surprised that Ryan Stewart saw the same thing that most saw last year. And, yes, I'm a managers don't matter that much guy. But today you see another example of Pedro costing his team runs where you didn't have to do it. He pinch hits uh, for Pilar with Dominic Fletcher. There's a runner on second with a leadoff double in the sixth inning. And Dominic Fletcher's a left-handed hitter. Like, at the worst, he's going to pull the ball on the ground to the right side of the infield. The guy gets the third, a productive out. Instead, he makes some bunt to the third baseman to sacrifice him over. And, of course, the next two guys, uh, Maldonado, and I think it was... Uh, to Young, yeah, got to out. Young then Paul, uh, then Maldonado got out. Of course, so that run didn't score. So you know, in that case, he was playing for one run, which I always detest, especially in a game that's in the sixth inning. So it's not like this run gives us a lead late in the game in the seventh, or eighth, or ninth inning. But it's just in the sixth inning, you usually try to get more runs and sacrifice bunts. I think are dumb because they were giving up an out. But I think that Jerry Reinsdorf and I hope he does, relinquishes his um, control, his power, to the baseball man in Chris Getz. If Chris Getz doesn't like what Pedro Grafal is doing and he doesn't see the results that he needs to see or the process he needs to see and he wants to fire uh, Pedro, go ahead. 
But I don't want to have that looming thing over Chris Getz's head. He's a first-year general manager. He doesn't need extra voices in his head. He doesn't need Jerry over his shoulder looking at what he's doing. Give the baseball man all the power that he needs. And if he believes that Pedro's not the guy going forward, fire him. But I'm not a, like I said, I'm not a fire uh, uh, managers in the middle of the season guy. This season's going to be bad anyways. Let Pedro finish it out. And at the end of the year, if you think Pedro's not the guy, bring a new dude, new, a new dude in. But I guarantee, since Jerry has denied that report, the last thing he wants to do is give Joe Colley the satisfaction of being right. Well, to, to what you were talking about there, Jerry, in the uh, in the media availability we had with him the day Chris was introduced as the new GM, was asked, you know, what, what is Pedro coming back for 2024? And he didn't say yes. He didn't say no. He said, that'll be Chris's call. And then we asked Chris in the, in the press conference mm -hmm. the same question, and he said, yes, and he cited continuity, right? He cited the fact that... Um, you know, there'd been a lot of upheaval, particularly in that position, you know, with going from Renteria to La Russa to Cairo to, to, to Grafol for the core players who have remained, uh, you know, and there were more of them at the time when he was introduced, obviously. But um, and so Chris is see Chris seemingly already made that decision for 2024. And Jerry, by what he told us, gave that power to Chris. Now, what I heard in Jerry's uh, statement to Bruce that you read there, Sean, was this is not Pedro's fault, which is something we heard over and over again from Rick Hahn last year before Rick Hahn was removed from that job uh, in regards to the disastrous season and particularly the disastrous first month of last season that Pedro Grafol was, uh, you know, helming mm -hmm. for his first taste of being a major league manager. And now here he is. They're 2-9 and nine in 11 games, right? The, it is a... A repeat in a way. Obviously, they've got time to make it not the case, but so far it's been a repeat of what happened last year. I don't think that, from what we heard, was going on in the in the with with the clubhouse kind of falling apart, and with by the sheer fact, Herb, that you and I agree on, Pedro Gravel's not the one going up there, not getting any hits, right? That I, I think that there would be some agreement on my side to the idea that this is not entirely Pedro Grafol's fault. At the end of the day, Pedro Grafol's the manager of the team, and the manager of the team uh, is typically judged by what the team does right. uh, in, in terms of wins and losses. But to expect, uh, you know, to expect the idea that uh, Jerry, who I believe has only overseen a fired manager once in his entire ownership tenure. Yeah. Mid-season. Mid-season, excuse yeah. me. Yeah. Mid-season. That was Tony LaRussa when Hawk Harrelson made that call and Jerry has looked back on it, calling it the worst mistake he's ever made. Right. And tried to then rectify by bringing Tony back again. So, and he's still here. It, it wouldn't, it wouldn't seem to be in line with Jerry's behavior to want to pull the plug on a, on a manager, not just in the middle of a season, in the middle of his first season. Yeah. Uh, it would seem that Jerry knows the game a little bit more and would exhibit the kind of patience that is, is necessary for that. But again, this is do dueling reports, obviously, or, or somewhat dueling, maybe. You probably have to parse that language a little bit more than, than folks might be doing, than even I might be doing right now. But, um, you know, uh, the reaction to me is I don't see them, or I hear, I hear an opinion that Pedro is not the problem, you know, poss potentially because of how managers are usually blamed. Part of the problem, okay, fine, but I don't think I'm hearing the chairman or the former general manager or the current general manager saying, oh boy, Pedro better straighten things out. That's the reason this team isn't living up to the potential. This team is not expected to do very much at all at this point. You know, I, I think if they agree on or if they are happy with what Pedro is doing behind the scenes, you know, in terms of the clubhouse stuff, the way he's acting, the way he's getting, if play fast comes to fruition and we can see that on more of a nightly basis, that would give us a clue that his, uh, his influence is being positive. Um, if that's what the front office sees, then I would have to imagine that is what they're judging him on now at this point, far more than it would be on what the win-loss record ends up being. My Uncle Ed is a very wise man, and he told me when I was 10, uh, when I said, I have dreams of being in sports media, he was like, good luck. Um, I was like, oh, thank you. Uh, and he's like, it's all about connections in life. And boy, has he been right. Uh, and I think Pedro Grafol's biggest connection is to Chris Getz. If he is the decision maker, Chris Getz was with him in Kansas City. Obviously, they have brought a lot of people over from Kansas City. I don't think that Chris Getz, in 
before his first 162 is up is going to say, I'm going to fire the manager and a manager that I respect. I think if anything, they're going to let him finish out the season and maybe they make a choice because, oh, Skip Schumacher was available. We couldn't pass up Skip Schumacher, right? Or something like that. I, I, maybe they th see an upgrade, but this ship is sinking. We said that yesterday. This wind doesn't save anything. Yohan Mankata just went out. Like this ship is in a horrible, horrible space. And I don't think that even if Pedro Grafal has a record setting year as the worst White Sox year in history, I don't think that midseason he's going to get fired because I don't think the White Sox want that distraction. Just like, hey, Pedro, get us through the end of the year. We trust you. And I know that when he first signed on, it was a reported a multi-year deal. Uh, apparently, it's three years long from Daryl's reporting in the Sun-Times. So he's in year two of three. The whole reason Cowley wrote about it was because of the dead money. And in Bruce's thing, it said, Reinsdorf adamantly d denied that the White Sox have ever considered firing him. That's not what Cowley was saying. He was saying that the performance was fireable, not that the White Sox ever considered firing Griffol himself. It was more that Reinsdorf doesn't like eating the dead money and paying other coaches to manage the team. So if anything, they'll buy out a year, not two years, is what I think. Like If, if they are going to make a move from Griffol, I think they're going to say, well, you got one more year left. We'll buy that out. And they have just made three cash consideration trades, so they should be flushed with cash to buy out Pedro Grafal's uh, contract. And also, think about this, though. They're 2-9 and nine right now, and they lost three of their top players, and, and John Brebbia, too, one of their top relievers. So at the end of the day, when we look back to this, people are going to say, oh, the three top guys were out for months, so or two of their three top guys were out for months, so that's why they lost. So this is an opportunity for Pedro in this time to improve the record from two and nine to whatever it's gonna be, and he can look back at that and say, "Hey, we won X amount of games without Luis Robert Jr. and Aloy Jimenez and Yoan Moncada because the clubhouse came together. Some of these young players, like if they get a dead can't bounce like they had in 2021, where players are stepping up, like you got today from Dom Fletcher." Then you can say, hey, we were down and out, and we only had a bad record, and Yohan left that game, and we were, you know, we had been caught from a 5 nothing lead to 5-5, five to five, and those guys grinded, and those guys listened to Pedro. They played fast, and they got dubs. So I can see where they can kind of, you know, make the story seem a little bit more rosy than it really is, and it's an opportunity for Pedro to manage and to have results that are more favorable for him because the record's already bad. We know the season's going to be bad. So if they finish and they look a little bit more respectable in this time period where they're out without their biggest players, I can see them saying, hey, Pedro uh, guided us through some, uh, some tough waters, and now we're on the other side of that. We liked what he did. We're going to give him his last year or let him go throughout the year because – you know, he had a tough uh, hand dealt to him both of the years that he was uh, the manager of the White Sox. I could see them making those excuses. Not really excuses, those stories, because it might be true. I mean, I think it's, I think it's, no manager is going to be successful if your best three players go down within the, within the first 11 games. Like, I'm not, I, I think that's a fair excuse from Pedro Grafal, but again, we talked about this yesterday. If he doesn't win, 50 games before they lose, what, 90, 97? He'll get to 200 losses before he gets to 100 wins. Mm -hmm. So that's the stat you want to avoid. And regardless, like you were given the keys to a Ferrari and you drove them to a 61 and 101 team. No, I know, but like. Really? No. Nah. No. <laughs> Give me a key. Did the I mean, Ferrari have, did the Fer Ferrari have guess, an engine in it? I guess Ferraris <laughs> are expensive and that team was $185 million worth of payroll. So. Keys to a used Chevy Geo. No, now it's a Chevy. No, you Chevy Geo. Yeah. Now it's a, a bike with one I mean, wheel. It was eighty one and eighty one. We I guess took over a unicycle. And then some wheels fell off when he was when he started driving it. Um, now he's on a bicycle. Yeah. Uh, the flat tire. Anyways, no steering wheel. That's gonna do it for the CHGO White Sox post game show. Uh, I don't expect Pedro Griffal to be fired at least this month. So we'll maybe talk about this later on in the season, if at all. Uh, that's Vinny Duber, our CHGO White Sox beat writer. If you missed White Sox Weekly and you are a diehard, go check that out at allchgo.com. And if you are not a diehard, sign up today, allchgo.com. Our guy Alejandro uh, is our current click to pick picker. Do we have a winner for today? That guy, hey Corey Lee, got seven points today. Uh, Corey Lee's what? Two for four day with two with a run driven in and two runs scored. 
No Dominic Fletcher love because no. he get the game winning hit. No, no, oh, okay. Right. He didn't that even was start. Only, that was his only. Doesn't hit. matter. <laughs> that was his only hit. <laughs> Paul the young one, and he will go ahead. They got thrown out at third. Ugh. Two playing. All right. How close was I? Uh, Barry, my Lenin Sosa. Cl- no, oh, no, I, you weren't. Close. I was. You I, were close. Yeah. I was close. It was uh, Andrew Vaughn was the second place guy. All right. Uh, well, appreciate Alejandro hanging out with us. Appreciate Melissa as well, who's a diehard. Uh, if you haven't become a diehard yet, head over to allchgo.com. You get this nice, lovely box that's under this hat, along with a sticker pack, a membership card, and get access to our CHGO Discord. So you get to chat with us and other diehards alike in our Discord throughout the game, and you also get a shirt of your choice from the CHGO locker. Thank you very much for watching. That's Vinny Duber at Vinny Duber. That's Herb Lawrence at Eckner Wall 23. Thank you to Lawrence Benedetto for producing the hey. show. Hey. Uh, and thank you to, uh, I guess, myself at Sean underscore W underscore Anderson. Hit that thumbs up button. We're four away from Luis Robert likes. Hit that like button on your way out. Bulls post game coming later. Cubs post game coming later. Goodbye. <laughs> Like the mayor, 